Anthropologists like to say that we live in an information society. In such a society, knowledge is central to economics. Understanding can be bought and sold. Ideas are the center of our cultural and political life. Many artists would like to address the information society, and in doing so may have to modify an understanding of art and science. Most people view the two as separate entities, a view that has been common since the Renaissance. But there are many cases when this separation has been tested. Modern art often demonstrates a receptiveness to scientific inquiry. Abstract artists were informed by technological development, the advent of photography, non-Euclidean geometry, and to an extent, the then young field of particle physics. Futurists often glorified technological development. Dadaists made ironic commentaries on it. In 1970, an exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art entitled Informationism showed the public that artists could address the information society. This exhibit by Kinniston McShine consists of seven linear feet of paper and 20 document boxes and one flat box. The first series featured secondary source material, periodicals and publications mostly. The second contained research materials arranged by country. The third, periodicals and exhibition catalogs related to conceptual art. The fourth contained alphabetical artist files. We see here that Kinison made information central to the form and content of his work, while in his words demonstrating the non-object quality of his work and the fact that it transcends the traditional categories of painting, sculpture, photography, film, drawings, prints, etc. This exhibit is largely credited with synthesizing the concept of information art, usually thought of as electronic art, synthesizing computer science information technology, and more classical forms like performance art, visual art, new media, and conceptual art. McShine affiliates information art with conceptual gallery art. However, Stephen Wilson, one of the few people to publish a book on the subject, sees information arts a little differently. In his view, many contemporary artists make an attempt to address information society, not just in the content, but in the technologies these artists use. Information arts can range from pop media, science fiction literature and film, to video art, kinetic sculpture, electronic music, and sound art. These categories all have their own histories, traditions, and aesthetics that have been well developed. Usually they are informed by scientific research and technological development. Would a typical film industry worker call herself an information artist? Probably not. Do most contemporary artists try to directly influence the agenda of research and development? Usually not. Attempts to categorize information arts usually focus on those who do. This is because, for one thing, it narrows a very broad term, and for another, these other categories have been well documented. But there is documentation of recent information arts. Perhaps the best way to examine both the strategies and the importance of information arts is to look at an example. Nuage Ver, or Green Cloud, was premiered in Helsinki in 2008. For one week, vapor emissions from a coal-burning power plant are lit by a laser animation. A cartoonish cloud is projected on a real cloud of pollutants growing larger as locals on the grid consume less electricity. Six years earlier, the project was conceptualized by Heha, a French duo known for reverse engineering common technologies, usually providing them new social contexts. The duo looks out a window while living in the suburbs of Paris. Outside, vapor emissions are seen from the chimney of a waste incinerator. A conversation starts. Ecology is talked about, data visualization is talked about. How are environmental issues presented in a way that could change the course of everyday urban life? How does one promote public discussion about industrial pollution? How does one do so with a minuscule budget and very few resources? The duo had to convince the owners and managers of a power plant for this project. Why? Heha could have projected onto the cloud without them. Technically, the cloud does not belong to anyone. However, 
They wanted the size of the cloud to have a real relationship to the power consumption of an entire city. Otherwise, the project would not be a social process. The visualization would not be based on real-time information, and the green cloud would have been only a symbol. They approached the owners of many power plants in France, getting turned down outright every time. Eventually, they looked outside the country, discovering Salmasari combined heat and power plant in Helsinki. The environmental director of Helsinki Energy rejected them, but remained open to discuss the project. The three argued about the project for hours. Finally, the environmental director warmed up to the idea. Perhaps Nuage Vera could be a positive gesture on the part of Helsinki Energy. Still, the company itself was resistant and would not approve. Heha continued preparation anyway. They began to work in a wide range of sectors, including culture, science, industry, communication, and ecology. The laser physics department at Helsinki Technical University and the computer science department at the University of Illinois lent their help in the technical development of the laser projection. Heha also listed the help of medical laser manufacturers and the energy producer itself. A Parisian design group developed an iconic language for the communication strategy. Three years after contacting Helsinki Energy, and just four months before Heha had scheduled the launch, the power company was finally persuaded by environmental activists and a government think tank to allow access to their production data, the information that would show how much power the local residents were using. For the first time, digital measurements of electricity consumption had been publicly visualized. I want to conclude with two quotes from Stephen Wilson. The first one is a challenge to artists, um, and the second one is more optimistic. I think describing a future, uh, you know, should artists accept the challenge. Here's the first one. I am simultaneously awed and troubled about the course of scientific and technological research. Historically, the arts kept watch of the cultural frontier. I fear that in the contemporary, technology-dominated world, they are failing that responsibility. Historically, the arts alerted people to emerging developments, examined the unspoken implications, and explored alternative futures. As the centers of cultural imagination of our times have moved to the technology labs, the arts have not understood the challenge. And here's the second. This century is characterized by an orgy of research and invention. Knowledge is accumulated at high speed. Unanticipated branches of knowledge, industries, social contexts, and technologies have appeared. These developments are affecting everything from the paraphernalia of everyday life to ontological categories. As the pace continues, predictions about future discoveries and their consequences are impossible. Optimists in the scientific community predict that further research will enhance the material, intellectual, and spiritual quality of life for all the world's people. Analysts such as those in the extropian movement believe that research is about to usher in the next stage of human evolution. Taking advantage of unique traditions of the arts, such as valuing iconoclasm and interdisciplinary perspectives, artists can choose to be a part of the efforts to create these new technologies and fields of knowledge.